Um, anyways, so in this module, we're going to be talking about different justification for why speech might be bad and why it might not be so bad. Um, so, well, many of us may have an intuitive bias um, that says extinction is bad. Uh, I think it's important to think about this in a more objective um, way, uh, which we'll try to do throughout this module. Who just came in? Where did Oh, but you all were already here, right? Yeah. Okay. Ethan, you were already here too, right? Um, what did you just get here? I just got here. Okay. Here, cool. Let's get started. So, um, so I'm gonna give you all um, a hypothetical scenario. Does anyone know how to put this up? No. Okay. I'm just gonna write on the side sentence. Sorry. So, suppose we have two options. Okay. We can save 100. All right. Two people in the back. We can save 100 people. Maybe. But we have a one percent chance of doing so, right? Or we can say one person is a one hundred percent chance. Okay. So if I save this one person, I'm guaranteed to be successful. But there's a one percent chance that I lose a hundred lives. Um, whereas if I try to save these one hundred lives, these people are all guaranteed to live. I don't. I don't have to take this one percent risk. But I'm guaranteed to lose this one person. Everyone close your eyes real quick. If you would save the uh, 100 people with the 1% chance, raise your hand. Raise them higher, please. All right, if you would save the one person, raise your hand. Is there an option to what? To do nothing. Uh, yeah, I mean, you don't have to vote, but uh, yeah, all right, hands down. All right, now I'm gonna give you all another one. Uh, suppose you can save 70 million people and there's a 100% chance of that, right? So that's obviously a lot of people. But you take the 1% risk of losing 7 point, like, four or whatever billion people, all of humanity, all right? So I can either have no risk of losing all of humanity, but I lose 70 million people, or I save these 70 million people guaranteed, but I accept this 1% risk that actually everyone goes extinct. Yeah. Does that mean literally everyone goes extinct? Like every person on Earth? Yes. So no one, no one else will Yes. For the 1% chance of that include the 70 million people? Yeah, even the 70 million people. So there's a 1% chance. Actually, I guess, so technically there's only a 99% chance I save these people, since there's that 1% chance that everybody dies. Close your eyes real quick. If you would save the 70 million people, raise your hand. All right. And if you would save the uh, all of humanity, raise your hand. All right, hands down. So, um, a lot of people stuck to their convictions and didn't switch. But there were, I think, four more people, um, four, three or four more people that voted to save the, uh, to save all of humanity. And they said they'd be fine with sacrificing 70 million people to do that. Even though you'll notice, uh, the numbers here are the exact same, right? Either way, we're saving 100 times the amount of people, either way, and the percentages are the same. But there's an additional element here which is the element of human extinction, which proves that even if just intuitively, um, many of us have some regard for um, human extinction, uh, can any or have some concern that would be uniquely worse and therefore invite distinct ethical consideration. Does anyone want to hazard a guess as to why this might be? Yeah. Yeah, because if you kill the 7.4 billion people, you're not really just killing them; you're also killing all future human progenitors. So you're functionally killing like 10 to the, like 80? Sure. Whatever. Yeah, 
So um, there's this really good article, not the Boston article. Um, after that, it's Farquhar and 17, and it's called Existential Risk Diplomacy and Government. And it analyzes extinction, kind of the ethics of extinction. And one of the thoughts experience, experience it gives is, suppose this. So I have scenario A, which is peace. Scenario B, which is 99% lost. And scenario C, which is 100% of people lost, right? So, Obviously, there's a difference between A and B, and there's a difference between B and C. The greatest difference here is obviously between A and C, because that's peace versus extinction. Um, who here thinks the greater di the difference between A and B is greater than the, the difference between B and C? No one? Yeah. Amy? Yeah. Okay, I mean, that's fair. Uh, it, so wait, everyone else thinks there's a greater difference between 99 and 100%? You know, that's only like, someone want to tell me why? Yeah, Michelle. If you lose 100%, that's like, it completely wipes out the matters. Okay, sure. So you could very well argue, I mean, I think you would make a very compelling case that we can't be sure exactly what the amount of future generations will be, and therefore this is a greater difference. Uh, Farquhar, however, says that the difference here is much greater because this 1% of people could potentially carry on the genes for billions of years to come, and that could lead to trillions of future lives, right? And if we assume that um, people living lives or more people existing is generally good, then that means this is trillions of people that could live like uh, happy, well off lives, uh, you know, the kind of lives that we may live um, and see their lives as valuable. Um, so one of the main arguments that people will make for uh, the value of future generations is the potential for future lives. Does anyone have any refutations of this? Yeah? Um, like maybe if even right now, future generations pro might not happen because um, the status quo, like, I don't know, like global warming means that like everyone's gonna die soon anyway. Sure, uh, anyone else have anything? Yeah. I think like um, the hypothetical like possibility of like all extinction does like justify like ignoring like whatever problems we have now. Sure. So, it's, like, um, so who here has heard of Epicurus? Okay. Right. So Matt. So Epicurus is an ancient Greek philosopher, and he kind of poses a question, which is, um, do we regret not having existed in the past? Right. So. Who here regrets the billions of years of the Earth existing that you they were that you were not alive from? So no one minds that we didn't live to see like um, anything else in the past, ancient Greece, um, you know, uh, I don't know Shakespeare, whatever, anything, any ancient China, anything in the past. No one cares. All right, you do. I mean, I, I think that you can make an arguable case for it. Um, Epicurus says, however, that we generally um, don't, don't, we don't value the past time we lost, which means, similarly, we won't value our future non-existence, right? Just as I don't value not having existed 500 years ago or a few billion years ago, I, don't, I also won't care about the um, infinite time into the future that I will not experience because I will not have the consciousness to even know what I'm missing out on or possibly know what uh, I could be losing, which then means that Sure, maybe all these future lives don't come into existence, but they also don't exist yet, which means they don't know what they have missed out on and therefore don't care. Just as they don't regret existing not now, these people also won't regret existing like a few billion years into the future because they've never had the consciousness to know what they're missing out on in the first place. Does anyone have any questions about this? Okay, uh, there's another similar argument um, which is um, kind of like, I call it the infinite people argument, which is that if it is true that we have an obligation to bring um, 
to towards future generation, towards lives that we that don't exist yet. This would seem to imply we have an obligation to uh, produce as many humans as possible, which intuitively seems to not make sense to us, right? I.e., there's seven billion people on the earth today, or whatever. We could probably have like a few billion more, and maybe and while there may be problems with environmental sustainability, um, I'm we could likely or conceivably manage a world with a few more billion people. But obviously, we may not necessarily want such a world, even though those, those people could um, experience you know, good lives on their own. Which seems to mean that this concept of future generations, um, if applied as a universal principle, um, justifies things that we may not be comfortable with, such as saying that we should all each uh, seek to bring as many people into existence as possible. Does anyone have questions about that? Okay. Um, does anyone have any other arguments that may create an ethical obligation towards future generations? Isn't yeah. kind of classic Boston argument that you can't be moral arbitrators if humanity doesn't exist, so we have an ethical obligation to prevent human extinction that way? Uh, yes. Uh, I will talk about this a bit more when we talk about uh, structural violence as well, though. Um, what about the concept of intergenerational equity? Can anyone tell me what this is? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It says that, like, well, the kind of, there's, the kind of concept is both brought up in an objection way and in a non-objection way. The objection will say that we shouldn't count future generations as valuably as current people because we don't know they exist. Uh -huh. Whereas the kind of response is that it's unethical to consider some humans in the future to be better than the ones in the past. Okay. So, intergenerational equity is the idea that even future generations are owed the same uh, resources and benefits that uh, society has right now. Um, this is why most people would agree it would be unjustified for us to destroy the world completely and you know um, leave future generations with nothing to have. Uh, why we have things like social security uh, that are designed to help people into the future. Um, the example Farquhar gives in this article is the example of nuclear waste policies. So nuclear waste cleanup policies, um, if we purely focus on our own value of this generation, it wouldn't make sense to clean up nuclear waste because it doesn't really impact us that much until well into the future. But a lot of government policies surrounding nuclear waste have had planning periods of up to a million years in advance, which clearly indicates that we intuitively have some concern for people, even if those people may not exist until a million years into future. Um, so Farquhar's argument is that if we accept that equality among peoples is good, that all people are fundamentally equal, then it would follow that we would seek to stop extinction because allowing extinction to happen would deny future generations the equal opportunity to live a life that we have right now. Does anyone have questions about this? Okay. Uh, lastly, there's one other argument. Uh, the, I'd like we should consider from the Farquhar article, which is premature death. So obviously, if extinction happens, not only do we lose future generations, you know, um, not the trillions of future lives in intergenerational equity, but we also would all experience premature death which Farquhar argues is bad. Um, one, because obviously, or you could argue, one, it causes pain um, to people that exist now. Um, and secondly, is that we would lose the potential to live out the rest of our lives. Uh, I.e., when someone dies young, like when someone dies in their 20s, um, not only do we say, oh, that person might have caught, felt so much pain when they died, we say, oh, they had so much life left to live. And this is exactly what happens with extinction. Because all of our lives are um, arbitrarily ended prior to um, our natural point of death, which means that we lose the potential to experience, um, you know, many good things that we could have experienced in life had we continued to exist. So this is another reason why extinction might be bad, and why we should uh, give it ethical priority. Does anyone have any questions about these arguments? Okay. Um, so now let's talk, and all of these, to be clear, um, 
all of these arguments and the refutations of them can be used to either argue that extinction should be the biggest impact or it should not be. Even if it is not being labeled in explicitly debate terms, all these philosophical concepts can be used to justify arguments as to why we should prioritize extinction or not do so. Uh, so now let's talk about ex comparing uh, extinction and structural violence. So um, first I'm gonna talk, first can someone tell me what structural violence is? I'm sure that many of us know what structural violence is. Yeah. Went to late in 99, so <laughs> in, in groups and out groups, and structural violence is a way of excluding certain people from our in groups. It's what? A way of excluding certain people from our in groups. Yeah, so I like that definition. Uh, it's some form of exclusion that um, is caused by structures such as like the government, the economy, etc. That means that people can't meaningfully um, live out their lives or participate as they would like to in society. Um, so an author, um, Olson and 15, um, kind of expands on this and asks the question, when we're stopping extinction or stopping future crisis, crises, um, whose world are we saving? Right? Because we say, um, there's this crisis we need to stop, we need to save the world and prevent extinction. Um, Olson says, that the world we're saving is not a world for everybody. Because obviously there are inequalities that exist along the lines of like race, gender, sexuality, class, um, disability, et cetera, and so on and so on. Uh, which means um, that when we focus on preventing extinction, um, sometimes we sacrifice uh, meaningful changes we can make in the status quo. Um, Olson calls this, I don't know if this, specific, this is the specific term used, but the argument is essentially that we defer problems that people face now infinitely into the future. I.e., we say, there are all these problems of structural violence and the status quo. Um, but first, we have to stop the crisis of extinction. We have to save the world before we can address this. Olson's argument is that we will always continue to say, we have to stop the next crisis, we have to do this next thing for future generations that don't even exist yet, as a way to defer um, the needs of people that are suffering in the status quo i.e. also would say, it isn't justified to say we should attempt to help future people that don't even exist yet while simultaneously sacrificing um, people that exist now. Uh, how can we say that we truly value humanity and care about you know, future generations when we don't even value people that are suffering in the status quo? Um, so this is an argument as to why structural violence or resolving it um, may ne necessarily come first before we can do things such as uh, addressing existential crises. Um, another author, um, this one is Abdel Rahim in 2008, um, makes a similar argument. And Abdel Rahim argues that extinction, of course, uh, symbolizes a crisis. I.e., we say um, there's this crisis, this existential crisis that's going to come, and it's going to wipe out all of humanity, right? But extinction isn't necessarily the only crisis, um, i.e. there are other crises like in terms of structural violence, right? Uh, but somehow those crises tend to become less noticed in society, similar to the argument Olson makes. Um, the argument Abdel Rahim draws from this is that when we prioritize extinction, we are only recognizing the crisis when it impacts more privileged individuals within society, i.e. Groups such as like indigenous peoples um, in certain areas, especially like in the Arctic, where they're being affected by climate change and lands are being flooded, are already going extinct in the status quo, or have been going extinct for hundreds of years. Uh, there's also non-human species, such as plant and animal species, where we have you know many, many species that go extinct every single day. But nobody notices those existential crises that people or even um, just other living things experience. Uh, which means that this, the prioritizing the concept of extinction in the way it's traditionally deployed in debate could arguably be exclusionary and ignore particular people or particular living things. Um, similarly, uh, furthermore, the author also argues that um, when we fear extinction so much, 
it causes this like existential insecurity where we continuously see anything as a threat to extinction. Even if there's only like a 1% risk like we looked at before. Um, which then means that any small problem um, becomes seen as a threat and we're forced to eliminate those threats in order to preserve life. But in so far as we continually have to eliminate any potential threat, we ourselves then create the crisis by waging wars or um, political or you know humongous campaigns or other very risky activities in order to stop extinction, which Abdel Hakim says is the actual root cause of extinction itself. Close your eyes real quick. If any of that or anything so far in the module does not make sense to you, please raise your hand. All right, uh, heads up. I'm gonna keep on moving then. Uh, there's one other argument. Um, well, actually, there's a couple. Of, actually, there's a few more arguments we could look at here. Um, another author um, is Shepard Hughes in 2004. And Shepard Hughes, I think there's another author too, but I don't remember the name. Um, Shepard Hughes argues not necessarily that structural violence should come before extinction or larger scale conflicts, but rather that structural violence is the internal link or root cause to those larger level conflicts. Uh, they talk about what they call, refer to as psychological priming. And the argument is essentially that in order to wage any kind of conflict that might risk extinction, like a nuclear war or a great power war, um, we have to otherize certain peoples and treat them in particular ways. I.e., we have to say, um, we are going to war with these people, they're not human, uh, they're less valuable than us, we have the right to conquer them, to nuke them, to take their lands, etc., etc. But this already happened within our own nations, um, even prior to waging like, large scale warfare. Um, it happened when we demonize people within our own societies and say, no, we do not need to allocate as many resources to them because they're less valuable. Um, we do not need to respect them, et cetera, et cetera. And Shelby Hughes says that with these, in these acts of structural violence, we psychologically prime people for conflict. I.e., governments will demonize a particular group of people by saying they're less valuable. Um, and then people kind of psychologically accept the idea that we can otherize people and say that other people are less valuable than us. Than, than, than us. And then they use that psychological priming and merely apply it to other groups of people around the world and then are able to go to war with those groups of people. Which therefore means that it's only, uh, we can only go to war when we first have structural violence. Um, only then can we demonize other groups of people in the way that we ways that we also demonize people that experience structural violence. Um, two other arguments I want to talk about for structural violence might outweigh extinction. Um, first is the idea of paralysis. Uh, so a lot of people will talk about this, and the argument is essentially that when we continue constantly fear extinction, um, we think anything might possibly cause extinction, right? Or some kind of, ter uh, some kind of terrible thing. Um, one author specifically is uh, Meskel in 2009. And Meskel asked the question, can I get into my car to buy a cup of coffee? Because for me, there is some risk that I get into a car accident and die. And for me personally, that would mean the extinction of myself, the end of my possibility for life, right? But obviously, I need to be able to live my life and just do normal things like get coffee or go to the store or whatever, right? But if I'm constantly in a state of fear over tiny, small risks, then that means I'm uh, essentially paralyzed and I cannot take any action that might improve my life. Um, which then means I lose some of the value to life, or VTL, that makes my life actually worth living. Um, and the last argument I'd like to discuss is why that value to life might necessarily precede just preserving life itself. So I'll give you an example, um, and it's a, an extreme example, but it illustrates an important point, which is suppose you can be dead, um, and just like a normal peaceful death, uh, or 
you can be tortured 23 hours per day. And then one hour, you get free. So for this one hour, you can do whatever you want. right? And you think this hour is meaningful to you and you enjoy it. But the other 23 day hours, you are tortured um, by a brutal overlord, um, and it's terrible. Uh, you absolutely hate it. Close your eyes real quick. If you would prefer to be dead, please raise your hands. All right, hands down. If you would prefer to be tortured for 23 hours a day. Hands up. All right, hands down. Okay, so there it was mixed here. Um, most people lean towards saying they would want to be dead. Uh, and I think I personally would agree with this. Uh, just because 23 hours of torture would be unbearable. However, uh, you could make an argument for why we should take, accept torture, um, although many people uh, might disagree, uh, although it's certainly something that's contestable. However, um, this gets to the importance of why value to life is necessary, i.e., if um, stopping extinction means that uh, we don't have a value to our lives, or even certain people don't have a value to their life, because we sacrifice them, as for like Olson and Abdel Rahim, then some people might say that should come before it. That means that extinction wouldn't be bad if no one had a value to life, right? If we were all being tortured 23 hours a day, we might just say it, might, it would be better for us to go extinct because then we wouldn't suffer this terrible torture um, universally. Which means you can imagine at some point where there would be some level of structural violence or some loss of value to life to where we might just collectively agree that we'd all rather be better off dead than accept all of this suffering. Which I think is one of the most persuasive arguments for why structural violence might come before extinction. Um, that being said, uh, there are some good arguments you can make as to why extinction would outweigh. So any of the far core evident arguments would certainly seem to suffice here. Um, future generations, Right? Obviously, um, under a utilitarian perspective, it might make sense to prioritize trillions of future lives over you know, some amount of people that are suffering from structural violence right now because there would simply be a net increase in overall happiness. Um, if we were to accept um, arguments about why equality is necessary, which obviously authors like Olson and Abdel Rahim presume, you would still argue that even under that perspective, you would still um, stop extinction because Otherwise, because the line it would cause intergenerational uh, inequality. Or you could argue that premature death is just bad and that it would magnify structural violence, which I think is also uh, a pretty good argument for why extinction might outweigh. You Wait, what did you say? Um, that premature death um, exacerbates structural violence and means we can't even solve it. So, um, Olson and Abdel Rahim might be entirely correct that structural violence is bad now and needs to be addressed. But most scenarios you can imagine for extinction would cause incredibly unbearable le levels of structural violence, a nuclear war, uh, a disease epidemic, uh, climate change, uh, things of that. All of those would obviously seem to be fur further proof as to why even if structural violence is bad right now, extinction might magnify that. And in addition, the extinction of humanity would obviously mean that we cannot address these things. Uh, the latter argument you can also use against like Phillips too, by saying, yes, your theory might be true, and maybe we have these ethical obligations, but we cannot fulfill those obligations if we are extinct. Which means you could argue it's what people refer to as a side constraint on taking action. <coughs> I.e., um, it might be true that we have an obligation to reduce structural violence or towards Kantianism or whatever. But that being said, um, that we, it's, it does not, that obligation um, is not absolute. And certain things such as extinction can mean that we have uh, no obligation to follow it. Uh, there's one other argument I'd like to address, which is this Michelle 17 uh, article. And piece of evidence, and Michelle takes kind of um, 
not an explicitly Kantian, but a more Kantian justification for why human extinction in particular might be bad. And Michel says, um, I accept that humans have distinct ethical value because we are the only rational creatures. And I think reason is um, important or binding or whatever. Uh, it's like the most important thing, which I'm sure Kantians would generally agree with. And then says that because of that distinct ethical value, we have an obligation to preserve humanity because humanity is the only rational species. Um, meaning that when we lose humanity, we use these uh, distinct and unique creatures that have the capacity to reason, to develop ethics, to uh, do all of these things that Kantians uh, would generally say are good things. Um, which means that once more, you can see how extinction might be a side constraint on such a framework because um, there's no way to be consistent with something like practical reason um, if humans, the only fully reasoning creatures, don't even exist in the first place. Does anyone have any questions about these arguments? Yeah. So does Kant fall on the side of structural violence or extinction? Uh, neither, because Kant would say um, you shouldn't use people as a means towards an end and actions would be universalizable. But both of these frameworks are at least consequentialist in some way. The difference is that this framework would say we shouldn't aggregate consequences, i.e. we shouldn't attempt to save the most amount of lives, um, whereas a utilitarian would say, no, it's only the most amount of lives that we should save regardless of the particular um, content of those lives, which means that um, a utilitarian would generally lead towards this side, whereas a consequentialist who wanted to just minimize structural violence would obviously lean a lot towards that side. Okay. Uh, so I'd like to move on then to discuss some arguments about the probability of extinction. Because when you're debating disads or reading disads that end in extinction level impacts, it's obviously an incredibly relevant consideration as to if extinction is actually probable. Since so far we've assumed that it is and discussed whether or not that would be a bad thing. Um, but uh, most people would intuitively seem to think that it's pretty unlikely that we'll go extinct. Um, However, there are some people who say that we should be a lot more focused on preventing extinction. I'm going to erase this as long as no one objects. Uh, so there's one article um, from Jaworski and 18. I don't like this on the board, too. Who's actually pretty qualified. I think they work at Harvard. Uh, and it also cites a study from Oxford researchers. So it's not like some random hack talking. Uh, let me get this going. Yeah. Uh, Jaborski in 18. And the title of the article is that human extinction needs a marketing department. And uh, what this author argues is it's like a study from Oxford researchers saying that there's a 1 in 10% chance this century of extinction. Which still obviously isn't near the level that your dissat's going to say it is, since this is an entire century, and even then it's only 10%. But it, is that it establishes the claim that there's a legitimate possibility that humanity could, humanity could go extinct within the next century. Um, from primarily anthrop anthropogenic risks, meaning human caused risks, such as nuclear war uh, and climate change, most primarily, as well as other crises, but these are two of the primary ones. Um, but despite this, the author argues that we, it's not that we're too focused on extinction, like some of these authors would claim, but actually that we're not focused on extinction enough. Um, so it gives um, a kind of weird example but one that I think illustrates the point the author made, which is they did a search through um, of recent scientific literature through Science Direct, which is a website for viewing scientific papers, and human extinction popped up 157 times. Whereas um, the term dung beetle, which most people would agree, is less relevant, popped up over 1,600 times. Okay. So 
10 times the amount of people in the scientific community are discussing dung beetle science as opposed to risks of human extinction and the probability of it. And the author says this is incredibly problematic because we've got this crisis on our hands, the possibility of extinction, yet um, scientific researchers are more concerned with studying dung beetles than the extinction of our own species. Um, and so this author can be used to establish A, that extinction is possible or even probable, and B, that we aren't too focused on it, i.e., the affirmative that's going to say, oh, extinction is not a risk at all, they are the ones that are actually being naive and not looking at the science and not looking at the evidence. Whereas the negative uh, could argue that, no, our extinction scenarios are actually the best science. Your authors just aren't talking about this enough. Which then kind of flips the script on a lot of the arguments, um, teams reading structural violence-esque scenarios, or just um, more or scenarios that don't in an extinction level impact will argue. Um, another author, um, Clark in 2006, argues that worst case thinking is good. Right? Right? Because generally we think of any extinction level event as an abnormality, an extreme circumstance, the absolute worst case that would probably never happen. But the example Clark gives, or the argument Clark makes, is that worst case scenarios are actually the norm throughout all of human history. You know, disasters and wars, obviously the worst case, have been incredibly prevalent throughout all of human history, despite the fact that they're the absolute worst case. Which means that we can't just ignore these things by saying we shouldn't prepare for them or we shouldn't try to stop them. When the catastrophe has actually been the norm throughout most of history. And it gives the particular example of 9-11. And argues how, obviously this was an example of a worst case scenario um, that you generally wouldn't expect. But in line with the rest of history, the worst case scenario became the norm itself. Which is to say that we realize that these things are the worst case scenario, but we still should make attempts to stop them, or else they'll become even more prevalent, which most people would agree is bad. Um, an author, uh, I think it's spelled like Schrader or Schrader for that, in 1991, uh, kind of makes a similar argument. It gives a specific example of playing Russian roulette. and how even though when you play Russian roulette, you're probably not going to die. You're probably not going to be the one that loses the game. Almost anyone would, anyone rational would probably not play the game because they say that any uncertainty is too high. I.e., the stakes are so big, so large, that you just refuse to play the game. Um, I.e., if there's a risk of affirmative cause of extinction, don't play the affirmative game. It's like playing Russian roulette with the human species, which is a good way to kind of um, uh, frame the debate so that your scenarios can sound more realistic and intuitively um, make the judge seem like they lean towards uh, your way of thinking. Um, something else to consider is um, an argument from Yudkowsky, who also writes about Utel. So many of you might be familiar about known versus unknown crises. So a known crisis crisis is one that has happened in the past uh, and generally been harmful. So an example of this would be like a war. Um, uh, things that we know about and can prepare for. Whereas an unknown crisis is something that we wouldn't really expect, like an asteroid hitting or maybe climate change, since at least humans haven't experienced the level of climate change we have right now. Things such as that, that we may not be as prepared for. Uh, close your eyes real quick. If you think these known crises are uh, more likely to cause extinction than unknown crises, raise your hand. Okay, hands down. If you think unknown crises are more likely. Okay, hands down. Uh, so there's a pretty good split, and I'm not too sure of the answer myself. But Yudkowsky's argument is that Known crises historically are likely to happen. And we know like, things like wars actually happen. Like, there is a legitimate chance 
of a war breaking out, and there's a legitimate chance it could cause extinction. Um, but Yudkowsky argues that because of that, there might be intervening actors, i.e., we know how to deal with the war, because we faced those problems before, which means that crises that are known, like a war, we'll just deal with those before they cause extinction. Someone's going to intervene or solve the problem, even though it might be really bad. It's probably not going to cause extinction because we know how to deal with it. Whereas unknown crises, we don't know how to deal with them. Which means that if an asteroid hits the Earth, we're probably not going to know what to do because that's something we've never dealt with before as a species. However, there is also, there's also the problem of history here, which is that we also have no evidence that these things could even happen in the first place. Um, so this is just something interesting to consider when discussing extinction impacts, which is, is the crisis you talk about known or unknown? And um, what considerations might arise when we discuss which one is more likely? Uh, on the other hand, uh, many people also make uh, pretty persuasive arguments as to why extinction might not necessarily be as potable. So Yudkowsky, and I'm going to erase this if everyone's okay with that, also talks about what's known as the conjunction fallacy. And before I explain that, actually, uh, I'd like to go over a thought experiment. So everyone close your eyes. Uh, actually, so suppose I say two statements. Statement one is a war um, will break out by the end of 2019. Okay. Statement two is um, the US and China wage war on August 17th of 2019. Actually, we'll say August 2019. They may do it on the 18th. <laughs> uh, anyways, close your eyes real quick. Uh, if you think it's more likely that uh, a war would break out by the end of 2019 than the US-China war in August 2019, raise your hand. OK, uh, hands down. If you think it's more likely that the US and China would go to war in August 2019, then the war would break out by the end of 2019. Raise your hand. All right, hands down. OK, um, so there was a decent split here. Uh, most people went with option one, but there were some that de there was definitely a de sizable minority that chose option two. Uh, this is what Yudkowsky calls the conjunction fallacy, where we assume that more specific events are more likely to be true. Um, i.e., it's just mathematically true that it's more likely that a war would break out by the end of 2019 than this one, because this, because number two is an example of number one, which means if two is true, then one's true as well. However, there are also other wars that can obviously break out that where one might be true and two wouldn't be, i.e., the U.S. and China could go to war in December of 2019, and one would still be true, but two wouldn't be. Or it could be like Japan and Brazil, and one would be true, but two wouldn't be. Which means, mathematically, one is just uh, more, tr more likely to be true. But the way disadvantages are usually structured is according to number two, where we have some uniqueness evidence, uh, a uniqueness evidence, a link, then a, few, a couple of internal links, and an impact, all very, very specific, making specific predi political predictions about what the affirmative would cause. But this is the conjunction fallacy, where we assume that, oh, the dissent is so specific. The evidence is so specific as to why the plan would cause these bad things. But the fact that it's so specific is exactly why that prediction is less likely to be true. Um, even mathematically, we just multiply um, the risk of each argument. I.e., if I say there's a 50% chance of uniqueness being true, 50% chance of the link being true, 50% chance of turning and 50% impact, I think it's like a 1 in 16 chance of the dissent being true. And that's even, that's even if it's just 50-50, right? If the, if the app's clearly beating like the internal link, and it's only 20%, then that means the risk is even that much lower. Um, which means that disadvantages generally are not very likely to be true, even if they're debated well. Um, another piece of evidence that argues similarly is uh, Cone in 2013. 
And this is couch, this is the couch six, by the way. So Cone is uh, a debate coach, actually. So it's arguably biased, and that's one of the answers he will make. But he also works for the New York Times, and is generally pretty qualified. And his argument is that when we analyze large-scale existential impacts, like a dissat, we normally say the dissat starts at 100%, right? I.e., if the app doesn't make any responses, 100% goes to the dissat. Code's argument is no, you start at 0%, not 100. I.e., the app doesn't drag this 100% down, the neg has to drag 0% up. And there are multiple reasons for this. Um, first is that there are hundreds of assumptions made by any dissat. So if someone here tell me a dissat, like any dissat that you've been prepping for the camp tournament or whatever. Or whatever. Yeah. China retaliation. So China retaliates when Japan gets, all right. So among other things, um, that assumes that like, China's not retaliating now. Um, it assumes that, what's the impact? The impact is that they're gonna go to nuclear war. Nuclear war. It assumes that like Japan would have nuclear weapons or other countries get drawn in. Um, it assumes that other leaders wanna check Xi Jinping when he goes to war or that other leaders wanna check Abe. Um, it assumes that the US wanna intervene and stop the conflict. It assumes that the UN wouldn't have anything to say about this, etc., etc. These arguments, all independently, may not be the best arguments. But any dissat inevitably assumes hundreds of things about the world that may or may not be true. Um, and even if I said there's like a 90% chance of all of these assumptions being true, if I multiply 90% uh, or 0.90 you know, times like 100 times, I don't know what the exact answer you're going to get here, but it's going to be very low. Even without the app making any responses, the assumptions behind the dissat themselves make it low probability. Um, and additionally, uh, Cohen argues that cards aren't actually definitive. Um, I.e., most impact cards will say, you know, if Japan were to get nukes, China might respond this way, and the US could get drawn in, and then um, they could use their nuclear weapons. And it could be possible that um, they wouldn't have any way to stop nuking each other, to like phone in and be like, hey, let's stop this war, et cetera, et cetera. It's just a long string, string of coulds, mights, and maybes, which means that even the card itself doesn't establish a 100% risk, unless you have like, a really awesome impact card. Uh, what that means is that the card itself may only grant like a 20% risk of the impact, which means that if each card in the sequence of the dissad is doing that uniqueness link internal link and impact, then that becomes a vanishing low probability even before the app makes an argument. Um, the last argument that Cohen makes kind of combines these two and argues that similarly here, you can just multiply probability. Uh, multiply the probability of each scenario and the risk of the deciding true is pretty low. Um, now of course, um, teams going for extinction impact will have answers here, and many people and Cone and many people argue that uh, well, Cone may be true in general. Like their specific disad is really good, and that the affirmative is of course so obligated to answer the argument. You don't beat an argument by saying I don't have to respond to this, uh, but it's something interesting to consider. Um, one last one I like to talk about is the idea of just pockets of survival. So remember that we looked at that Farquhar article near the beginning of the lecture. We saw how the difference between 99 and 100% of humanity going extinct is much greater than the difference between um, peace and 99% go going extinct. But most dissents probably don't actually culminate, or most advantages to, if the app is reading extinction. But most probably don't actually have everybody go extinct. Uh, even in a nuclear war, for example, there's some pretty good evidence that says like New Zealand might survive because they're so isolated, or there would be like some Pacific Islanders that would survive. Or if there's a disease, there'd be like, some people that are immune to the disease. Or for climate change, certain people uh, would not suffer the effects so severely. Which means that unless 
unless it's actually true that literally everyone goes extinct, then none of these arguments about future generations or intergenerational equity or anything else that we talked about uh, are necessarily accessed by the team reading the extinction impact. So one thing that can help out is point out that oftentimes the impact card doesn't actually say it causes extinction. It might say it causes nuclear war, and that there's an implicit understanding that nuclear war causes extinction. But without that being explicitly um, argued and one within the round, a lot of these extinction first impacts might not outweigh. Um, arguments like premature death would still apply, because obviously 99% of people dying is still bad, really bad. But you wouldn't be able to necessarily say we have this obligation to preserve trillions of future lives or an obligation to future generations or so on, unless it's true that actually all 100% of people go extinct. Um, so that's kind of the last thing here. Um, so all both of these can be used to argue against disadvantages or advantages of extinction level impacts or for them, uh, since there are a lot of good arguments going both ways. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Great. Uh, if you do have any questions and you just don't want to ask right now, or you think of something later, you're definitely always welcome to talk to me during the Socrates hour, or if you see me at any other time. But besides that, you all are good to go.